Welcome for the sixth lecture on econometrics a master's course methods. In this um, uh, lecture, I will um, teach all the data um, related issues, um, particularly how to obtain the data for a survey. So I first start um, with um, showing some flow diagrams of a general procedure. Then um, what is uh, the population, the statistical subject and everything is about, it need to be defined properly. Also um, electronic surveys, which you sometimes um, in some way you can also do by yourself. And uh, then uh, finally some um, examples of um, how to do surveys depending on the degree of subjectivity. So first, the general procedure of econometrics uh, and then how the data obtaining uh, process is um, fitted into that. So first, you need to define the objectives, of course, of your um, research and also check if um, the past literature, the past research, if your objective has already been investigated, that's of course clear. Um, that's um, before beginning the actual investigation. Then you need to specify the survey design uh, and that is closely related to uh, which endogenous and exogenous variables you have available. Available means either uh, you, there are already data which you can use or you expect to obtain in your surveys if you uh, econometric undertaking also includes taking your own survey. So this has to be closely related to uh, uh, specify the survey design, which variables can you obtain and um, how, how do you obtain them. That's all uh, sort of a design. Also at this level you should already check uh, the model which you want to use because the model um, is specified among others by the exogenous and endogenous variables. And you should make sure to um, always obtain all the variables your model uh, needs to do, because otherwise you cannot uh, proceed. Once you have made sure the uh, design, you perform the actual survey. I will give on the next uh, slide details. Once you have a survey, you have all the data, hopefully, if you obeyed um, these um, provisions here, then you can do a parameter estimation or confidence intervals and tests. So all the statistical machinery, which we um, learned in the last lessons. And finally, the output, either the output is significant, then you can report the results. If it's not significant, you can also the report the results if it's, um, for example, by saying um, we cannot reject our null hypothesis. Remember, null hypothesis can only be rejected. Um, and if you, uh, but of course you can also try um, getting more data. That means performing um, another survey and um, uh, iterate this process until you are um, done. So this is a general procedure. Now we look at detail in uh, performing the um, survey. So first you need to define the population. The population is um, the basis from where you want to draw your sample. For example, all the people in Germany. We will come to that um, later. In particular, your population need to be um, delimited spatially temporal and also with respect to the attributes. It's careful to, um, um, to have an exact um, uh, specification of what is your population, because otherwise your statements, your statistical statements are not valid. Then of course you cannot um, survey the whole population. You cannot uh, survey, for example, every person in Germany, so you need to define the sampling base. That means, for example, some register where you want to draw some um, samples. Okay, then um, in line with the general procedure, you need to define the attributes you want to um, 
ask. Of course, all exogenous and endogenous variables of a model must be contained, but um, just to make sure you should always also include some socioeconomic properties such as age and gender. Um, we will come to that later because you never know. Um, this will be always useful even if not uh, used in your present uh, version of, of, of the model. Then you need to select the survey instrument. Um, so that means first how to get the data. Um, just a random sampling or some systematic uh, sampling, some rule, we will come to that. Also how to, how to sample, um, either just a measurement, but typically if you have to ask somebody, even written, oral, personal interview, um, then uh, which design do you want to use? Um, for example, um, cross-sectional meaning, um, ask all um, the sample at one time, giving a snapshot. Longitudinal uh, means is basically for measurements, just making time series. Um, panel is asking um, um, a certain, so to say, panel of persons repeatedly over time. Uh, once you have um, uh, finished your survey instrument, uh, that means your concept, you should do a pretest because um, in actual uh, survey, so several things can go wrong, particularly um, that uh, people do not understand your questions and take too long or um, just drop out because um, the questionnaire is too long. And that should be checked with um, um, pretest. That means just um, um, give the survey, the questionnaire to some um, selected people, it can be your friends, um, um, and check if they understand everything. And if everything is correct, even this pretest data can be used for the main data. So once the pretest was successful, you can do the actual survey, that means the realization. So now about the survey designs, which we already, which I have already mentioned. Um, the simplest case is just time series, um, basically, for example, traffic count. Um, <clears throat> but that's not the core of the um, subject which we will treat in here. These are just automated measurements. But we will come to that in a, short, uh, a few slides later. Um, basically, what I've done here with this um, big uh, black uh, box is the population. That means the um, set of all the uh, statistical units um, um, which are um, to be interviewed. With this may be persons, this may be households, this also can be cities. Um, all this is represented by this large box and if you have time series, it's just for a few properties of this uh, subjects, um, statistical units, you just record data continuously in time, giving for example this red line which is it's just a few data, that's why it's so thin, it's over all time. And it's maybe only on, on, on very little um, locations. Um, what's more in line with our um, um, uh, investigation here is cross-sectional data. Cross-sectional data means a snapshot. Because it's only a snapshot, you can use a big sample, this the sample dimen dimension, dimension is uh, represented here. Of course, this blue um, sheet would represent the whole population. That's of course um, irrealistic. I just visualize it in this way. The bigger this blue sheet, the more the, um, the wider the blue sheet, the larger the sample. Also, how many attributes do you um, survey? Each person has thousands of attributes. You only want to survey the, rele uh, the relevant ones because you cannot pose too many questions because otherwise the um, people to be asked will tire, will drop out of the uh, interview and so on. So basically just a snapshot that's cross-sectional uh, data and cross-sectional design. You can do it repeatedly over um, um, long periods when you have the so-called trend design. Basically you do a repeated cross-section um, survey um, every, say, 
few weeks or a few years. We will give example later for uh, mobility surveys um, who do cross-sectional data every um, four or five years or so. Um, combining these two are the panel data. The difference between panel and the other um, designs is you repeatedly ask the same um, person. That means you just define your sample at the beginning of the panel um, uh, investigation and then um, you try um, at later interviews to get the same people. Only if you have drop or dropouts, um, you will replace the people. Also you will replace because people get older and you want also to have maybe the same age group. So you um, uh, need to replace um, the panel by younger people, but should be replaced as few as possible. The advantage of panel data is um, all artifacts of the um, of the sample, for example, you just chose an eccentric person, but if you assume that this person um, remains eccentric over the time, then more or less in the trend, that means in a change of time, all these peculiarities drop out. So this gives, um, if you want to um, investigate trends, for example, um, is the model split, does the model split change um, towards public transport or not, then uh, this is a good um, good idea to do. So these are the uh, um, visual representation of uh, survey designs. Before we proceed, we need to define the basic terms, uh, which we already mentioned, but um, should be defined uh, uh, formally. First, there's a statistical unit, the subject. Uh, that's, um, quite literally the subject of the investigation. It can be, can be one person, it can be one household, but it can also be uh, one city. Uh, then there's a population. That's basically the set of statistic units. And that is the um, set you want to make statistical statements about. And this is uh, crucial that this is delimited in by, at least by three dimensions. That we have uh, um, also the dimensions of this box. First space, for example, can be all in Germany. It can also be certain cities, uh, whatever. So it's just a spatial restriction. You do not want to make statistical um, statements about all people of the world or all cities of the world or whatever the statistical unit is. Then of course time. Of course now people or cities have different attributes, values than say 100 years ago. And time can even have a certain date. Um, it can be a, a, a certain a time period, for example the whole year 2018, or it can even be open end. That means um, that's typically the case for trend or also for panel um, designs. They start at a certain point and then just um, uh, maybe even underway. And finally, the attributes. That's basically the properties of the statistical unit. For cities, this would be for something as a population, um, the, um, the location, the average income of a person or so. Um, in the more interesting for us are um, persons as statistical units. Um, maybe you do not want to, um, in your population, all the persons which um, in a certain space um, um, for a certain time, but maybe you only want adult persons. Um, may also be that you are only interested in women. And also, um, if um, maybe you want to pre specify the space delimitation further, for example, if the space delimitation is Germany, um, you might um, ask, should I also include the foreigners living in Germany um, at the um, given time of, of this um, um, delimitation? Or should I not only um, uh, include native Germans? Also, if you want only native Germans, what about Germans living abroad? So that means all this needs to be um, specified and delimited um, in the 
third category of delimitations, the attribute um, delimitations. So, and finally, you have samples. That's basically um, choosing a subset of the population which you want to investigate. In most cases, the sample is quite small. So, if you have 80 um, millions of people in Germany, maybe you have a sample of 2,000 persons. Um, and when you need to um, uh, specify your sampling procedure, um, and also you need to specify um, from which register or from which data power spaces do you draw your sample. For example, if you have persons, a typical database would be the um, register for inhabitants. As I said, there are different ways of how to obtain the data. Um, nowadays, um, the electronic means of obtaining the data gets more and more relevant. Um, Moreover, you yourself can use um, this such electronic surveys in your own uh, projects, also in, in, in a master thesis or some um, other uh, thesis. Uh, so I want to um, give some um, peculiarities of electronic uh, surveys, um, how to do a design an electronic survey. Um, so I've just here given as an example of such a survey. That is, uh, in fact, from, from our university, the Technical University Dresden. It was a survey why people choose um, to um, select a Dresden or their um, um, present um, uh, location where they live. And um, the first question is, what are the reasons why you live where you live? Why you live in the city where you live? Of course, first you need to ask um, which city it was, um, but that's, that's before, that's where I dropped, but now why do you live where you live? And obviously there are um, several possible reasons. For example, I live together with my parents, it's my job, I, I moved to my job, the partner has a job there, um, or it's uh, some um, f um, f closeness to uh, friends, also the leisure activities, um, maybe also f uh, uh, it's an attractive city, ma many clubs and so on, um, it has an att attractive scenery, it has a good um, uh, bike uh, a path network and so on. Um, the cool thing is these are cumulative properties, that means you give a certain number n properties and you can select one or more of these properties because surely you, there's not only a single reason uh, why you live in this city. And if you have such cumulative um, um, uh, boxes then use the square check boxes. You can click it, it's not active, I cannot do it here, but then a, a, a OK sign or a hook um, will appear. And um, that's all what you have ticked, and that's um, what is your answer. Don't forget the others category, because here you have um, this closed question. Um, basically, uh, the, the respondents can only select the answers you have already given, but there may be also that there are other reasons, and it's um, uh, you should also try obtain these other reasons. That's why you have one. Um, um, others, one category others, and then specify this others category in an open question. That means here you can just end the text um, that you like. Um, another category of data are ordinary, um, ordinal data. That means, um, for example, you like something very much or you take preference to something very much, a little bit, um, you are neutral, or you dislike this or that property. Typical if you have some um, subjective opinions, uh, I like it very much or I hate it very much, then use a so-called um, Likert or Likert scale. Um, it's crucial that you always choose a symmetric scale, that means uh, with a neutral central element. Most often you have a five um, a step um, Likert scale with a neutral element in the middle. For example here 
that's um, that is true completely. That's more true than false. That's neutral. Um, that's not um, uh, in tendency not so, and that's uh, not true uh, at all. So these are. But you can also use three or seven steps um, depending on your design. What you also give is a feedback about your progress. It's not shown here, but in, at, the, at the bottom here, there should be some bar the progress. For example, if you have 10 such um, um, forms, um, so if you um, typically you click um, next, uh, if you are done with that, and then you come to the next form, and you should have some progress bar, because otherwise uh, people do not know when, when they are finished, they have no success um, experience, and they there's a high risk of dropping out, so you get incomplete questionnaires. So that's, that's also um, always you need to ask socioeconomic uh, properties. For example, um, where do you live, where do your parents live, um, and so on. Also, what is your um, gender, uh, what is your age, um, and what is your um, education level? So here is for example, also you, you may have exclusive properties with many possible values, but only one, one exactly one in N, that's typically done with choice boxes. So these are these um, squared circles which get checked. But if you check this, and then you check this, then this check sign will move to that. You, um, unlike the squared button, you cannot have multiple um, ticks, only one. Um, then, so it's, um, and in our methodology, such exclusive um, uh, alternatives are very crucial, because that's uh, what is the basis for the discrete choice models we will uh, learn uh, later about. If you have binary, um, then you can check if there are checkboxes are very best. It's basically as here, um, but just two checkboxes. Um, I uh, mentioned the highest education level. Um, so if you have ordinal cumulative properties, with ordinal cumulative, um, I mean, if you have a university degree, you have all automatically also a secondary school degree. And if you have a PhD, then you have also a, um, a finished university degree and so on. So this is, um, and of course it's also ordinary because, ordinal because there is a, um, a, uni, a unique direction from um, less to more. Um, but then you are only interested in the highest of these um, properties. So that's why, why I typically only um, ask for the highest um, education level, because automatically the others are included. So they give no more information and only it costs time for the um, interviewed persons. I said that it's um, um, in most cases you should ask about the, some social economic properties. The basic ones are uh, age, the income, the gender, um, but this may be tricky because not uh, everybody wants to reveal their um, true age. Um, if you want it really um, precise to the year, then it's better to ask for the birth year than the, um, than the year. Um, basically the same information, only formulated and different. Often, however, it's sufficient just to um, get information about the age group. For example, um, are you um, between 10 and 20 years, 20 and 30 years, and so on. And then you have already an exclusive tick list. You can then just tick one, and you are done. It's also easier for people than just to enter directly um, a certain number. What about the income? Nobody wants to reveal his or her true income. Uh, uh, moreover, uh, most people do not know it exactly. Um, and also it's conditioned what kind of income. Is it the uh, gross income? Is it the income after taxes um, are um, um, drawn? Or is it also the, in, the available income, which also 
um, needs to subtract from a cost not only the taxes but also the rent um, for, for the living, uh, social security, health security and um, all these. Um, what is the solution? What do you think? What you can do? Uh, first you can give a reference. For example you can say the average income after taxes is 1300 euro per month. Then um, the answer is uh, you can basically uh, amounts to RI do I have more income um, come as a subjective average or less? You can also use categories. Um, that means again a, a Likert scale for example. I earn much more, uh, more about the same, less or much less in a Likert scale. So we now come to some examples. I order them according to the degree of um, subjectivity. Um, basically you need a trait of between precision of, uh, of your results, trustworthiness of your results and what you can ask for possible questions and also the information you obtain. In principle this is similar to the um, significance level where you can weight uh, between um, uh, trustworthiness, um, reliability of, of, uh, of um, statements and if you can, can make this statement at all that you can control by the significance level. If you have a very low level, for example one person, then you get highly um, trustworthy um, um, statements but often you get no statements at all because it's very hard to reject the null faces if you have a very small uh, alpha. Here it's similar. So um, basically there are three different um, categories of course, the highest precision and trustworthiness because it's more or less objective is the physical measurement at least if you have um, calibrated your uh, measuring instrument. But that's not the core of our lecture because typically you need to um, uh, question um, a persons. Um, that means you need to survey a persons and there, because you cannot read minds, um, you need to do surveys. Um, the automatic measurement would be the mind reader which is not yet available and hopefully will not uh, do so in the uh, next uh, future. And if you uh, ask person there are two possibilities. You can um, ask about actually performed um, decisions that you did for example at a certain day. That's, um, or you can ask for hypothetical situations. If you have already perform, performed situations that mean for example um, given a certain day, what trips did you realize on that day and to what uh, purpose? Uh, for example the sequence or the chain of trips. That is obviously realized if it's, for example, if you ask, um, think about last Monday. Which trips did you um, do during this um, day? That is uh, revealed. That means actual taken decisions are recorded. Of course, you can also lie, but it's um, because it's you, you have actually performed. It's most people will not lie. Um, However, you cannot um, uh, get all informations with it. For example, um, what is if you have some alternative which not yet exists? Um, for example, uh, uh, a new kind of transport service with um, um, automated vehicles and so on. These are hybrid hypothetical situations. Also, sometimes the um, alternative already exists but um, it's expected that their attributes change in future. For example, if um, gasoline vehicles will get less attractive because of the rising um, price of the gas or if um, electric cars are subsidized even more than they actually are, what percentage of people will um, change their buying decision for the next car in favor of an electric car? That's because it cannot be realized at the moment. 
This can only be asked with stated preference. And um, not because it's hypothetical, it's not only it's easier to lie, but maybe some people will not even know how they really will decide if they really need to take this decision and not just think, for example, think of electric cars, maybe many people say, oh, it's surely it's the um, interviewer wants to um, learn that I will use electric cars, maybe this is politically more correct and so, but in if you are really stand um, uh, before the actual decision, maybe you will think a little bit more about um, the flexibility and the money and so on, and we will decide differently. That cannot happen if the decisions are already taken. But you see, this is more precise, the revealed preference, um, but um, the stated preference is um, you can ask uh, more. So it really depends on your investigation, which, which sort of um, investigation and survey you want to undertake. So let's come to the first. Um, I will keep it uh, very short. It's just an objective measurement. Uh, regarding traffic, the, the most common objective measurement is just um, a vehicle count. This is a Google Maps view of um, a German freeway. And here you see these small um, rectangles. In fact, these are induction loops and they are double loops because when you cannot only record that a vehicle is um, driven over this loop, but you can also, um, by means of a time delay, um, uh, estimate the speed of a vehicle. So that's a typical induction loops which can be found every kilometer or so on German and also on other um, freeways. Single loops can be found before many intersections because the adaptive controllers nowadays um, in operation at many um, intersections need, of course, some information, um, how many vehicles are waiting and so on. So we have single loop detectors for that. Here, for example, I show the daily um, flow. That means a daily demand uh, curve. Typically, you see the um, early um, 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 rush for, for the jobs, the, the morning commute, that's the evening commute, and but there is also high activity in between for um, all other possible other activities and less uh, in the death of the night. So it's two to three, uh, four hours. Because these are double loops, you can also um, record the speed. And here you see something interesting, the speed possibly tops, uh, uh, suddenly tops down um, during the morning rush hour or a little bit after it. Um, and if you um, magnify it, so this is the same um, uh, speed time series, and if you magnify it, you see that you are really stop and go traffic. That means you observe a passing stop, um, passing traffic waves um, between about um, 7, um, 15 and um, 9.30. So these are objective measurements, which is not the core topic. Now we come to the um, revealed choice. Remember that is the in, in between um, uh, precision, reliability, and the number of um, questions you can pose. Here that was an in-class um, um, survey, which due to this COVID-19 situation cannot be performed this year. Um, so this is just, um, I just ask all the um, audience um, first what is the distance to the, um, um, from their home to the um, university. So it's just a trip home to university. Um, and I uh, classified it in uh, several distant groups. Um, you can also um, give a, uh, all um, persons a separate um, a questionnaire, which you would do in a real situation. Here in class, I just, um, made it um, uh, uh, public and that of course I need um, age uh, uh, distance classes. And obviously the people who um, are very far away from a university will use fast modes. That's public transport and car. 
in this group, no, no, not a single one used a car. But maybe it's also biased because it's not politically correct to use cars. I do not know. Um, but obviously, you see that if you have a short distance, when you use the slow modes, pedestrian uh, or the average uh, mode bike. And um, if you are faster way, you use public transport. You also see that many people, much more than average, use public transport. That, of course, is due to the so-called semester ticket. That means in order to get immatriculated, you need to buy a mandatory um, a season ticket, which, which you can travel um, all means of public transport, buses, um, of trams, um, also even um, the ferries uh, within um, Dresden and also in the surrounding. So this was example one. Example two is the um, Reveal Preference Mobility Study SRV, System of Relevant um, uh, Verkehrserhebung and Traffic um, um, uh, Surveys, which also led by TU Dresden. Mobility, what is mobility? That's um, basically how often you move, where you move, um, and um, <coughs> at which time you move, um, and also the trip length, the traffic volume, and so on. So let's do what um, uh, remember about the specifications of population, of um, subject, and of the delimitations. So a population in space, it's German cities, so not wholly German, but selected German cities. Time, 1972 till home end, and um, the attribute delimitation, none. That means also childs uh, are included. Um, um, also foreigners are included, everybody who was selected, uh, at least foreigners are included if they are in the um, register, it means, uh, if they are in the inhabitants register, because it was a sample. So a sample selected cities, survey period, so it was a trend design, and um, each um, um, actual um, in investigation was for a, a whole year, but um, there are um, gaps for four or five years in between. Um, so you get several cross-sections um, in selected years as a cross-sections. Uh, 2018 was the last. That was the 11th cross-section of this um, trend um, design. Um, so what about the sampling um, procedure? The sample was layered according to city size and season. So you see uh, city size, um, Berlin, that's Berlin, um, has of course a higher um, number of um, uh, in the sample than, for example, Dresden. Dresden is here, 2,600, and Berlin had um, 38,000, 39,000, um, because of course uh, Berlin is um, a, a bigger than um, city. Where do you draw your uh, sample? From a register of the cities. How do we sample? Um, basically random, that means in each city, uh, after you have layered according to the uh, number of inhabitants, you uh, do a random sampling. But not, it's not completely random, but it's also clustered because um, you draw a person and then all the household, that means all the other persons living in the same household are um, um, asked, um, surveyed, as well. Um, what do we think if it's um, if the uh, um, population would be households instead of persons? Is there some bias? In fact, there is a bias because um, a six-person household has a six times as high probability of getting um, drawn as a one-person household. So, um, but this, if if there are questions about households. This can be um, de-biased, unbiased by some awaiting procedure. So what is the interviewing strategy? That means um, um, how to actually obtain your um, sample. A base is a classic telephone interviews and also service uh, mail um, sample interviews. <coughs> 
if um, however if people want prefer telephone instead of um, um, written they can do so and also vice versa and also people can in the latest uh, interviews also request an online interview crucial if they request online interviews they get a one time and a one off password um, with an access to the questionnaire because unlike your uh, interviews you maybe will do in uh, in some projects um, where everybody can take part maybe you publish it uh, in your by your facebook profile so you have no control who takes part here you have control and only a one off password um, makes sure that only you and nobody else can answer this questionnaire um, <clears throat> Also, because you know whom you addressed, you also know who does not respond. That's a bigger problem and an ever-increasing big problem, the non-responders. Nowadays, about 6, 70 to 80 percent of people do not respond. And of course, maybe just the busy people do not respond. That means you get a biased sample. At least, but at least if you know who does not respond uh, and you have some... Um, information uh, from, from some registers of what this person does then you can maybe unbias it a little bit um, and anyway you include the weight the answers of the um, responders also for example if more women than men responded you can um, weight the uh, a male respondees uh, higher than the uh, female ones so just uh, how does such a questionnaire look like? First you um, get some questions about the households. Um, how many persons live in a household? That's ne necessary for um, then unbiasing if you want the investigations regarding the population of the households. How many modes of um, transport means are in uh, does this household um, own and so on. Um, more interesting for us are the mobility related and personal related um, attributes. Of course, the channel attributes is. Um, let's look how they um, answer the um, age. Is it here somewhere? Yes, yeah, so here, date of birth. As I said, date of birth is preferred to just indicating the age and also the gender, uh, male and female, männlich and weiblich. Um, so that's a social economic attributes which mobility related are of course the highest um, um, degree um, of um, education degree because that of course also influences the mobility decisions what uh, kind of profession do you um, uh, um, exert do you have a driver's license um, um, do you have a, a car and if so is it, um, is it a um, in, inside a garage and so on. Also uh, other questions uh, refer to how do you have um, season tickets for public transport. And also the driving purpose is um, responded. That's a question, uh, that's an example of a trip which is maybe not so uh, valuable uh, but it's also a trip purpose of course. So this, now we come to the activity related attributes. Um, for many attribute, for many investigations, it's um, relevant to get the objective of a certain trip. That means whatever, what do you do at the destination? For example, work, bring your kids to some um, uh, institution, uh, get your kids, um, do some errands, um, do some um, professional activity, uh, do some uh, leisure activity. Uh, and so, or to, to get or fetch um, something, somebody or something, and so on. And that is for each person. Also, when do you took this trip? Um, by which mode do you take this trip? How far was this trip? And what was the traveling time? Uh, maybe some, what do you get from such surveys? Um, here is a um, from, the data of the total mobility, that's just how many kilometers did you traveled at this day where you have been asked to 
to make um, statements. Um, and obviously it depends on the age. Um, also with, uh, it has distinguished between a big city, Berlin, and the smaller cities. And also if you um, travel with um, motorized individual traffic, that's basically a car. Obviously, um, the, if, if you're middle-aged, your car activity is um, higher. And if you live in smaller cities, your car activity is much higher because in Berlin, um, you do not really need cars. Cars are also often stolen or destroyed, so it's not very attractive to have a car in Berlin. But it's, you need it in some smaller cities because there are not so many things you can within um, pedestrian or bike distance and the public transport is also not so developed as in Berlin. Also regarding the age, obviously um, at 20 years many people do not yet have cars. So in both Berlin and smaller cities we mostly use public transport. Um, later on the usage of cars increases. However, what does it mean that also the smaller kids use cars? Uh, that of course does not mean they drive themselves, but they are just uh, passengers. So that's just, um, does not answer the question, uh, do you drive this car for this and that trip, but do you sit in a car for this or that um, trip? Another um, investigation result would be the model split. Um, the four classic modes are um, pedestrian, bicycle, public transport, and car motorist. That means motorized individual um, transport. And obviously in summer, the usage of bikes is higher than in winter. Um, and with such patterns, you can um, check how the attractivity of bikes um, depends, for example, on the climate, on, on the weather, and so on. Also, of course, you can have the temporal patterns. Uh, that's what I, um, um, that's the basically the same similar pattern as um, I showed for the automated vehicle counts. Um, only that here, because um, you know the purpose of a trip, you can say this is, for example, to work, this is from, uh, from, from work at home. And there are also other trips, for example, you can also see that Nowadays, people get later to work. The peak, the morning peak is delayed. The evening peak is um, interestingly, um, gets earlier. Um, obviously, at first sight, this means that maybe people do not work so long um, um, in the different times. But you see, um, in, in the automatic, you cannot make this distinction between this and that, um, but here you can. You need not do mind reading, but just to record the um, destination, the, the purpose of the trips. As I already said, not everything can be answered with um, um, revealed uh, preference studies, because um, the set of alternatives is restricted for revealed preference, because you just um, can only um, ask about things people actually did. But sometimes you also want to know what, how people would answer if the setting uh, has been changed in the future or if um, novel alternatives uh, will become available. That, of course, can only be done if, um, if you have um, virtual situations, hypothetical situations. Examples are price in future may be different. Uh, that means the, it shifts the attractivity of some alternatives, um, some uh, destinations, for example, a future, future supermarket may not yet exist, but the owner of the supermarket chain would like to know if this new location would be a good one or if um, this company should not consider opening a supermarket at this position. Um, maybe even um, other modes, For I already spoke about this battery electric vehicles, um, um, under which conditions uh, are they um, uh, attractive. Also, only with uh, stated preference, you can go to the limits. With go to the limits, I mean, I change the settings of my choice sets. A choice sets is um, 
a selection of alternatives with all attributes in every alternative. And I can change this, for example, if a people, if somebody choose to drive car in one setting, I just make the car a little bit more, unattr more less attractive, increasing the costs or the um, travel times. Uh, and look when this person switches to another alternative because you get the most information when you have some choice sets where people chose one alternative and other choice sets where they choose another one. So you can make more effective questionnaires, particularly if you make your future questions dependent on the answers to the previous one. There exists software where you can design such um, um, adaptive questionnaires. Let's do an example again um, in class survey. Unlike the last survey, where I have asked about realized um, uh, mode choices uh, from the way from home to university, now I ask um, some hypothetical situations. For example, I, um, I assumed um, every person um, owns a bike and also every person owns um, a car or public transport. So maybe they do not own, um, but um, neither car bike nor car, but uh, it's hypothetical. You can just assume they do. The options should not be too um, utopic because then people cannot um, imagine how they would um, uh, decide. For example, if I have a, th um, a, a fourth alternative um, unknown flying object, which maybe is um, free of charge and um, uh, beams you to your destination instantly, um, but it costs uh, big money, uh, that would be a little bit unrealistic. So the decisions would be of not no real value, but everybody can imagine what it is like to, to, to have and drive a car, even people without a driver's license. And here that's just what um, I as I said, in a, a, a stated um, uh, preference, um, stated choice um, study, I need to define choice sets. The first choice set is, for example, I have three alternatives, pedestrian, bike, and public transport and car. Here, because many people do not use cars in, uh, in our, uh, at our students, I let here the, uh, the choice, which of the alternatives they want to choose for alternative three. For example, here, pedestrian 30 minutes, bike 20 minutes, and car 20 minutes. And it does not cost because maybe you have a semester ticket um, or your parents sponsor all the operating costs of your car. And so um, it, it does not cost. And um, how many would, in this situation, choose the uh, public transport car the most? And then I, uh, for example, I, I make the um, public transport alternative less attractive by adding two euros to it. Notice that these two euros are ad hoc costs. That means, of course, you have paid, paid for your public transport also by yourself by buying your semester ticket, but you need to do it anyway. So your ad hoc cost, that means the additional cost, the marginal cost, uh, when you choose for that certain decision, the public transport or not, is for you zero. But here I increase it to two euros, for example, for adult persons who are no students and who have, do not have a semester ticket. Then of course the um, alternative um, of shifts, most now use the bike. And here you can use different um, attributes and, and get um, different um, distributions of um, choices. I also can uh, add the effect of bad weather. Um, that's, that's the red alternative. Here you see that the bad weather drastically changes the usage of bikes um, in favor of the public transport. Of course, because 180 minutes the pedestrian option was prohibitive and had not been chosen for in either weather. Also here remember that the situation must not be too um, uh, unrealistic. At the day I took this um, survey, 
the weather was nice. So the standard uh, situation was for nice weather. And only um, I asked one question about uh, the bad weather. It's also crucial to record the weather, um, particularly if you have um, um, revealed preference, because you see here that the weather makes a much uh, a big, it's a big influence. So finally, there is um, a certain way for um, you can do this choice sets that's um, in connection with discrete choice models, which we will come um, in the next um, uh, big lesson, um, choice based conjoint analysis. Conjoint is an abbreviation for considered jointly. Um, that means um, you consider simultaneously all aspects of a choice set, such as travel time, costs, and so on, including all the, uh, the attributes of the competition alternatives and all the interactions. That's um, why it's called consider jointly. And basically, it's um, if you do it systematically, there are several possibilities for a choice set. Typically, you have discrete steps in your attributes, for example, travel times 10, 50, 20, 25, 30 minutes, um, the same for public transport. And also, you have ad hoc costs, maybe only 0, 150, 4.5. The easiest and um, most stupid, stupid would be, of course, exhaustive enumeration. Then in real investigations, which the number of combinations will get prohibitive and also many combinations are of no value because if you combine, um, say, a public transport, uh, let's say, um, um, with for 50 euro um, and with uh, 30 minutes with a bicycle, with zero euro and 10 minutes, then of course everybody would choose a bicycle. Um, so there are better designs. One is the orthogonal design where um, no, um, uh, 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 there should be no correlation between the travel times of the alternatives and also no correlation between different attributes of different alternatives. But also this does not solve the problem that there are so-called dominant um, choice sets where one alternative is worse in every aspect with respect to another as, uh, alternative and therefore only the dominant alternative is chosen and you get no information gain uh, when posing this question, which is wasting value um, interview um, um, time. And that's finally where this effective design, which you cannot do by yourself, but uh, only by a, a software. Uh, and where you also need to already have a model and this software uh, optimizes the information content you obtain for every, um, um, with every uh, question, given a fixed number of total questions, because this fixed number is determined by the total maximum total time this survey should um, take, because it takes too long, people drop out. So this was a lecture about um, surveys, how to obtain data. Uh, many thanks for listening.